Sound and Voice uh, session. This is David Al Ibrahim. Uh, David worked with us on a session, uh, a program with A plus C actually last year uh, called uh, Calling Thunder, um, which was an amazing experience. Some of you might have tried at our uh, summit in September, um, where he recreated the sound of Manhattan uh, during the time of the Lenape Indians before Western settlers came here. Um, it was an incredible audio experience. He literally went down to the uh, Cornell Ornithological Institute or something along those lines um, and learned about the, the sound of, of uh, the insects on the island, uh, the birds, uh, the fauna, all, the flora, all the rest of it, and was able to recreate the sound, which I think was kind of an incredible experience. We asked David to run this session, so I'll turn it over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Hey, Matt. How are you doing? Good to see you. Hey. And uh, Terrence, Matt, and Agnieszka are going to come in and uh, all introduce yeah, ourselves before we begin this conversation. Um, Terrence, you want to kick off? Sure. Uh, so yeah, I'm Terrence Calkins. I, I work uh, at a company called Arup, and I do acoustics and audiovisual design. My background's in uh, immersive audio, and I do a lot of work around oralization, which is uh, allowing you to hear a building before it's built. My name is Matthew Hartman. I am at uh, a venture capital fund and uh, studio called Betaworks. We, <coughs> excuse me, we build companies and we make seed stage investments and are very focused on, have been focused on audio for the last three years and uh, more recently on computer vision and, and augmented reality and the interrelation between those two. Hi, I'm Agnieszka Roginska. I'm a, a professor here at NYU. I'm also the associate director of the music technology program. Uh, and my main area of research is immersive sound, immersive uh, auditory environments, both from the creative aspect, but also from the technology aspect, how, how to create and use technologies to create these virtual auditory environments for various, various purposes, which I'm sure we'll talk about today. I'm excited that we're doing this in the morning, too. It struck me that, in a sense, uh, audio has kind of been a historical driver in innovation around immersive experience technology. You know, radio brought world and stories into the home. Uh, when the Walkman was dropped in 79, we started using our first augmented reality headset where you could overlay music into your day-to-day -day life. And uh, despite that, it seems that you know, audio has kind of played a less than front runner role in the kind of the recent hype around you know, AR and VR it tends to be a very visual conversation or interactive technology platform one. And so I'm excited that we kind of bring it back to the roots in audio. Um, Agnieszka, do you want to kick us off on some of the things you're excited about uh, as it relates to the way audio is going to help us frame the future of these immersive spaces? Uh, sure. Uh, <clears throat> so I think in general, this is a very exciting time to be in, in audio and, um, and thinking about how audio can uh, not only enhance an experience, but really create, create the experience and put meaning to the experience and infuse the experience with the emotion that music and sound can. And um, so when I think about the kinds of things that are happening right now in the industry and in the research field, there is you know, a lot of emphasis on, um, well, how do we, on, on one level, recreate an immersive experience, just as it would be a real experience? How can we use the technologies that we have and come up with new technologies to uh, create an experience that, well, you can't tell what's real, what's not? But I think a more exciting part of this is, once we're able to do this, creating experience that would not be possible in the real world, creating whether it's from the perspective of collaborating with other people. Uh, my, my, um, a lot of what I do is, is in the music space, so creating experiences where we can bring musicians together who would otherwise not be able to be in the same place at the same time, dislocated by it geographically, but we can put them in the same space and they feel and they sound as if they were sharing an environment. I think those are the kinds of things that are very exciting right now. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think it's important that we also frame that you know, immersive reality and, and future reality may not necessarily be designated just to a headset or headphones. These are, you, know, you can transform physical worlds as well as you know, digital worlds as well. Terrence has spent a lot of time kind of around the transformation of physical space through sound. Um, really interesting projects on you know, this New York City subway with his work at Arab. Do you want to talk a little bit about kind of 
the role it will play in the physical space? Sure, yeah. I mean, uh, on a subway project or an airport project, what we're mainly trying to do is to make sure that people can hear messages when they need to hear them. So we're working on the uh, physical materiality of the building that modifies the, the essentially the response of the building, the signature of the building, in order to sort of absorb sound where it needs to be absorbed and, and send sound where it needs to be sent. And then looking at like the electroacoustic devices and how they are giving you information so that you can actually understand you know, what you need to hear as you take the subway. Um, I think beyond that, where, where I'm excited uh, around where we are right now with uh, spatial audio in particular is to uh, essentially be able to recreate really realistic feeling experiences, kind of like what uh, Agnieszka is talking about, is to essentially augment the virtual reality experience with the real signature of the virtual building that you are in. So we can go to a space and using special microphones actually capture the signature of the space and then recreate that using uh, you know, a three-dimensional array of loudspeakers and really make it so that it feels like you are in the particular acoustic of the space. So like right now here, there's a little bit of, of like a delay and an echo that is very specific to the wood floor of the stage and this feels like I'm in this auditorium and I can recreate that virtually. And I think even though the person that's in the experience might not notice it, that's gonna add to uh, the sort of immersiveness and the, the feeling of the kind of unmediated, uh, uh, just tricking your brain into being mm -hmm. in the environment. What's interesting is you're kind of talking about technology playing two roles, both as a way to enhance or, or augment the physical one, but also as a prototyping tool where you're kind of using virtual reality to prototype the acoustics of physical space. Yeah, and that's what we do. We, we have a, a sound lab and we use spatial audio technology to essentially capture existing buildings so we can benchmark a concert hall, capture the acoustics of that room, and then have a client listen to what the concert hall is gonna sound like, and then design a new space and, and, and essentially create a computer model of that space that will be very specific to that design and allow them to hear it and, and, and hear a comparison between an existing space that they might like and their future space under different design iterations allowing them to make informed decisions that might have huge financial consequences on the building project and to be able to do it from an experience of the space as opposed to from a written report that tells you the reverberation time is 1.8 seconds, which to most people is not gonna mean anything, but put them in a space, a difference between a 1.2 and a 1.8 second space, it's a totally different experience. So it's really designing by experience and, and I think for for people that work in the built environment, this is a very exciting uh, time to, to be in. Mm -hmm. Matt, how about you? Uh, I'd be curious to hear kind of from the technology and platform side, like, wh where are you excited? And yeah, I mean, I think that's so, that's so interesting to be able to, the, the notion that you're, what well, we think about it, it's tying back into augmented reality and the percentage of your experience that's taken up by sound versus, by, or made up by sound uh, versus the percentage of your experience that's, that's visual. Um, it, it's, it's so, it's just, it, it was actually really interesting to hear you talk about because we hadn't talked about that earlier. What you're trying to do in, in, in consumer experiences, in, in creating new products is, is take them away, it's take them someplace else. And c it, it, the whole purpose of a product is to, to change the, the, um, output from being, here's a bunch of, here's an equation or here's a bunch of numbers or here's, here's a description of what the thing will be like to actually showing them, right? And, and I think what we're seeing, we talked about th anything from something like the HoloLens where you have a very constrained field of view and sound being the thing that helps you navigate and understand what's going on, um, to things like, do I believe that I'm there? I, I, I'd love to hear, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, one of the things that you had talked about, was, you've done research on is, is just trust in your environment based on sound versus based on what you see. And I thought that was sort of fascinating because that's another area where I think our, the people who we're investing in who are building virtual reality experiences can learn a ton from when, whether th something feels real. Yeah, and I think it comes down to, to, to biology, really, how, how, we are, uh, how we've evolved as human beings. We, the auditory system is really, I mean, even 
in the womb, that, that's the first sense to be, to be created. And we, our auditory system and our auditory sense is the first one that gives us the sense of, if, are we in danger? Is there a tiger running behind us? Is there you know, some uh, a, a twig snapping in the, in the forest? That's going to be the first sign that we know that oh, there's something there. Then I will turn my attention and, and, and look at it and then examine it. But that's such a, such a big part of who we are that we trust our auditory sense. We really, really trust it. So in the, in the case where if, if you have an object where maybe there is a slight mismatch between the, the visual and the, and the audio, for example, the, the, the ventriloquism effect, perfect example. You have a sound and you have a, uh, the, the person who is speaking who are dislocated. Who do you trust? Well, you're gonna trust where that, that object is. But in, in the case, if you have an object that is made, let's say it looks like something that's, that's gray and it looks like perhaps metal, but you tap on it and it sounds like wood, what are you going to trust? You're gonna trust your sense of hearing, saying that, okay, well, if I tap on it, it sounds like it must be wood, maybe painted wood, it may be wood that has been some, uh, some uh, transformed, but you're gonna trust that sense. So our auditory sense really is very important in, cre in creating a realistic sense of a virtual space or the space that, that we're in. Yeah, I think we, as, you know, as we were speaking about this earlier, it was this idea that we don't see in 360, but we always hear in 360. We're very attuned to our, our dimensional you know, sound environment. And I think you said also that you know, we, we don't close our ears, but we can close our eyes. And so this idea that we can, you know, we're, it's, it's a very important space to be considered as we try to build out these you know, more and more realistic or you know, immersive environments. Do you want to talk a little bit about um, how you, you know, on, on top of that, the, the, um, the way in which we're using audio to make this a more exciting experience or inviting one, you know, why are we going to be going to physical spaces in the future? Why are we going to be, you know, looking to these uh, you know, immersive experiences? I think it's a big question that, um, you know, many venue owners and operators are asking themselves, right? Because as we get these more and more advanced individual experiences for people at home, you know, you can, you can stream the Met Opera, uh, uh, you know, potentially in your living room and have maybe a, a nice spatial audio system or, or you're doing it over headphones and it, 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 you know, we're, we're, we're creating these sort of high quality, we're going towards more high quality experiences at home, so how do you get people to go to the venue? I mean, this is a real question, right? And it, and it has a, 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 a real monetary implication, both for venue operators and for artists who are making a lot of their money from touring and people going to see shows. So I think there, there's a real question there about how can you augment the, this experience of coming together as a group of people you know, in a space? And, and I, I feel like there's a huge value in going to the space that is around being with other people because essentially, as we were saying earlier, um, we're pack animals and uh, we want to see each other, we want to feel each other. And I think there's something about having a plastic headset on your face and headphones on that's very isolating and kind of sad. And if you're going to a space to everyone wear a piece of plastic on your face, you might as well just stay home. So I think you know these spatial audio and these more like projection mapping type VR experiences are where we're going to be headed. And, and we see that in a temporary way. But I think in venues, we're going to start to see that in a more fixed, permanent way where you're having this really potentially transporting everyone in the space together that can feel each other into a VR experience. And I think that's what we have to try to achieve as venue designers. It's so funny. Can I, I, it's so funny because when you, when you were first starting to talk, I was thinking actually about the exact opposite use case, which is you, w w if we get so good at capturing the space and capturing the sound and, making, and f make presence feel like we're really next to each other, then isn't it great how many more people will get to experience something? I mean, you have people who come from all over the world to go see like a Broadway show, right? And it's prohibitively expensive, right? And imagine if they captured that and you could capture it in such fidelity that you could create experiences that anybody across the world could, would be able to attend that. You might actually increase the total pie of people who could, could see this stuff. And it's just interesting to hear how like, my, my mind went to, wow, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> we can build a bunch of new things, and, and uh, there's, but there's definitely some downsides to it. Maybe the, both are true. Yeah. Yeah. But I also think that because of that, a lot of people are asking themselves the question now, 
what will make a person come to the Broadway show? If you can mm -hmm. see the same experience in your living room being just as real, what will make you come to the show? Or what will make you come to go to a, uh, a sports event? And, um, and I think that I mean, the, the, the title of this event is the future reality. And we really have to be thinking about well, what are those future realities going to be looking like? Can we create a, a music experience, a concert, a concert experience that will be super real, where you wouldn't be able to experience this at home because, for example, you may be sharing it with the other people who are in, uh, uh, attending this, this concert hall, or maybe you can take yourself and bring yourself closer to the performer, which is not something you can do now. Now it's still a very passive experience, let's say, but maybe we can create ways to enhance your experience being there by either making it more personal or more collaborative or more social or more something else. And I think that the the opportunities on both sides are, as you said, it, it is kind of both. You know, it, the opportunity to also personalize the technology. You know, typically, we have we have not known a lot about how users are listening or you know in, interacting with sound, and so you design a really beautiful interactive uh, acoustic environment, and then somebody plays it on their phone without headphones, or they put in you know fifteen dollar earbuds, and all of that complexity is lost. Moving forward, you know how much more are we going to know about our users and how can we design a more personalized experience and understand their context? I, th I think that is key and I think we already we know a lot about people who are experiencing whether it's TV or what you're watching on the internet or the kind of music that you're listening to. We can identify to a pretty, uh, um, pretty focused um, who, who you are and where you come from, how old you are, what demographic you come from. And having that knowledge can give you a lot of information about how you can create a better experience for that person. And I use like better in quotes because better means, may mean something different for you, may mean something very different for me. It may mean something different for people who are 18 years old versus 65 years old. Uh, for example, if we know that somebody is uh, maybe elder and they, we know that they will have you know, productive hearing loss, we may be able to enhance their experience, their auditory experience by compensating for that, for example. Um, or if we know that they're in a loud environment, which we know we very easily can, we can compensate this auditory experience. If we know that they're listening over headphones, we can recreate the spatial auditory experience because we know that they're over headphones, so using some sort of virtual uh, ambisonic or virtual surround sound system. If we know that they're in their living room, they're listening over loudspeakers, certainly that would be a very, very different way to present sound. So having that information can enhance the experience. If, we're, if they're in the car, for example, that will look completely different. Um, so having that knowledge will be really important to enhance this, this experience for, for every person. I mean, right now, the way we, uh, like even when we look at music, the way we mix music, it's still very traditional. You know, you're in a recording studio, uh, whether it's a professional studio or if it's your, your home studio, you mix, you have your surround sound, if you're lucky, and you're gonna mix for that. But over 90% of the people who are listening to music are listening to the music over earbuds or headphones. But yet we, we don't have that translation yet. You know, we have some you know, pretty good upmixing filters or, or some compensation um, algorithms to make the headphone experience a little bit better, but we're not really doing what we could be doing to make that music experience a, a lot better. And has that affected, you know, in terms of on, on the production side, I mean, on, the, on the recording capture, how is that changing in your space? Yeah, um, so uh, you know our background in sort of capturing buildings with using like spatial audio microphones. It's been really interesting to apply that in the sound design field, and and we do we've worked with artists over the years and worked on a lot of different projects where we're creating spatial audio experiences, and you can capture spaces using these 3D microphones, and they give you this incredible feeling of being in. Uh, the space that you captured when you play them back. There's something about it that all of a sudden the walls of the room that you're in kind of disappear and you're in a much bigger space and you feel you know, the atmosphere of people moving around you. However, these microphones, as anyone who works in production, who's a real audio engineer, someone that really knows um, sound, will, they'll tell you they have a limited sort of spectrum, a limited t timbral capacity. They don't sound as good from the pure uh, sort of uh, bandwidth as like a, a really good, um, you know, Shups or Neumann or the traditional sound engineering microphones. So what we've been doing on projects and I think where we're headed in the future is to combine traditional microphone techniques that you'll see, 
you know, the, the, the sound engineer at WQXR setting up on the stage at Carnegie Hall with stereo microphones over, above each section, capturing a really nice, good quality uh, mix, and then maybe that combined with uh, like a, a 3D microphone above the conductor's head, and then you're able in post to essentially combine this atmospheric feeling 3D audio mic with really good sounding point mics that you can virtually re-spatialize. And I think this sort of hybrid approach is, um, is something that we've certainly been applying and, and is really the way to go if you want to have the high quality audio with the kind of feeling of being there. Yeah. It's, you know, feeling is, is interesting to me with sound because you have both the emotional feelings attached with sound. I think, Matt, you were speaking about this earlier. And then you also have the, the haptic feeling of sound, where sound has a presence that is not just heard, but is diluted in headphones that, you know, in a physical space, you can actually feel, you know, the resonant, you know, the vibrations of sound. And so I'd be curious to hear how all of you think, you know, in terms of in the future, how we can drive, a, you know, play with both sides of feeling sound. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, maybe maybe some people in this room are are you know practitioners and have like used uh, the sort of sub pack, for instance, makes a product that's like a backpack, um, a low frequency of, of vibration object, and and, I, and I've I've felt it in certain experiences. It was really amazing actually to give you that low frequency feeling that you would only get out of a giant subwoofer system that's actually shaking your body. Um, and you can do that on, a, in, on an individual level without being too loud and overwhelming like the room with low frequency sound. Um, I think it also has to be envisaged, uh, uh, you know, at, uh, the tool has to be used correctly because I've also had experiences where I go to a movie and, I, and there's a butt kicker in the chair and it's not mixed properly and like when the vocals are going into it and you vibrate every time someone speaks and it's terrible. Yeah. So it, it has to be really uh, designed and, 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 and done, the entire line has to be sort of thought about, like what the medium that you're reproducing over and how you're actually uh, sending the audio streams to it. I mean, I'll, I'll take sort of a different consumer angle on it, which is uh, we invest in a company called Anchor, which is an audio first social network. And when they were first talking about the friction, the psychological friction of creating audio. It's sort of like, it's the, uh, kind of like the equivalent of Twitter, but for, for audio, for your voice. They, one of the things that uh, they realized was that if you hear your own voice before you post it, you, you don't want to post, <laughs> right? Because we all hear, our, it, it, something changes in the way that we, we speak into like a, the, the, your iPhone or, or Android microphone, and then you play it back. It's like, wait, that's not what I sound like, right? <laughs> and so they put a lot of thought uh, one of the things they, they, when they were first starting, they were thinking, how do we make it so that either when we play it back, we can augment some of that to try to make it feel the way it feels like it's, it's in your head, or not show it to you, <laughs> right? And it's just sort of interesting to, um, uh, to, to hear on the, on the, I think on the subwoofer side, it's almost like a micro, a micro example of that, but they're, in, that case, in this case, they're building it back in, trying to create frictionless user experiences by just making it sound like they haven't done anything, anything to the sound by doing something to the sound. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, the, the, the reason our voice sounds like it does to ourselves is because of bone conduction. It's because it's not just the content, but it's the way our entire head vibrates when we speak. So when you're, when you're listening to yourself, uh, uh, a recording of yourself, you sound completely different. Oh, that's not me. Of course it's you. And so there are even these, uh, these plugins that you can add on your voice that will make you know, your recording sound like a, as if you were talking inside your head. So it's interesting. But, but the bigger point is that we, when we think of sound, we always think about you know, the content or the, the, the immersive sound experience. But the haptic part is actually very, very important. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the limiting factors that you have when you're listening to uh, the sounds over headphones or, or earbuds, you will never, ever have that. Not without some, some vest that you're wearing or some sub or some sort of loudspeaker system that will augment this. So just presenting sounds over, over headphones is, you know, it's, it's nice, but, but to get that immersive feeling, oh yeah, I feel like you know, this bomb is exploding next to me, it needs to go beyond just listening uh, over headphones. And, and I think that speaks to a sort of, I mean, immersive is such a buzzword right now too. It's like immersive this, immersive that. And yeah, yeah, I mean, one, one, the first thing I think of with immersive are these sort of multi-channel loudspeaker systems, but really if you've got one really good sub in a room, 
it's going to feel immersive. You're going to immerse people. They're literally in a field of sound that they're sharing together. And I, th I think one of the really powerful things about sound that you, know, that, that you were touching on earlier around sound in a movie and, and the sort of emotional aspect of sound, it, it really actually hands you an emotion in this way. And I think in a venue, also, you're having this shared immersive experience with people. And you're going through an emotional experience with a group of people, which I think is a very uh, unifying and very important thing that we're trying to do with art and music and all of these things is actually really bringing people together. Mm -hmm. I just want to add one thing, because you know, we were talking about immersive experience and these sounds surrounding you and being everywhere. But what we less often talk about is the personal experience. You know, it's one thing to put sounds out there and feel like you're in this big concert hall with a big orchestra. But what's really challenging is getting a sound that feels like it's right next to you. Getting that sound of a bee buzzing around your head. It's hard to do with loudspeakers. It's a lot easier to do with, with headphones. But, uh, and there, you know, there are many, many technologies that, that kind of attempt to, to do that. But getting in that personal space from a sound person is very challenging, but mm -hmm. so, so effective. And so emotionally charged, too. Yeah, I think that the ability to offer a, a very emotionally charged experience often comes down to sound and getting people to, to stop and listen, you know, stop and listen to the world. You know, while people are on their headphones more and more, there's also trends where people are you know, watching, spending less time paying attention to content quickly. You know, how do you, how have you used or how do you see using sound as a way to get people to pay attention more, to listen more, so you can offer these kind of emotional experiences? Well, I mean, thinking about the information side of sound, right, is like you have, we have now this increase in podcasts where people are walking around and I am kind of a data geek and so I started tracking the number of articles that I would listen to, the number of words I was listening to compared to how often I could read and you end up finding like an extra six to eight hours. If you have a 30 minute commute, you can listen on 2x speed, you end up with like a whole day of time uh, where you're con consuming more content. I actually. I get made fun of because I listen at 3x speed, but I think as a result, I talk really fast. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but, but, the, but I think that's, it's a whole new, when you step outside your, when, you, when you're waiting in line for coffee at Starbucks, you, uh, you look at your phone and you've got 50 apps competing with each other. You have Snapchat competing with your email, competing with a text message you just got. When you step outside of, of this building and start walking someplace, there's like three things that compete. There's Spotify, there's podcasts, there's um, a phone call. And that's, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of your, your, your solution set. So there's a bunch, I think there's a bunch more that we're going to see in terms of, it's unfortunately or unfortunately, people trying to get your attention specifically in the context of sound because it's sort of the last remaining bastion. Like there's not, there's not that much more time in everyone's day that we can send them push notifications anymore. You know, as we go towards our question time, I, you know, maybe briefly, for those of us who are kind of trying to explore and create new immersive sound experiences, use some of the new tools and technology out there, are there any lessons or tips, you know, that you guys have learned in your experience that you could kind of offer as a, here's how I would think about <coughs> something you could offer to, as maybe even a perspective on, on how to think about sound in virtual or immersive spaces or physical? Oh, uh, okay, I, can, I guess I can try that one. Um, uh, you know, one, one thing that was sort of maybe is obvious, but, but it's only obvious once you do it. In a VR experience, when people are looking around, they have their own unique perspective. But if you think about a space that, you're, that we're in right now, the sonic field is, is in, 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 in a certain way, it's not moving. When I rotate my head, the sound sources are still in one spot. So if I'm creating a loudspeaker experience around VR, I actually don't necessarily have to make it rotate when, uh, when something, when some sound goes through. I just have to make sure that that sound is actually moving through, but the, 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 the loudspeaker system itself doesn't have to move. It can be a fixed system. So you can create um, a kind of, a, uh, quickly create a VR experience that's augmented where you're attracting people's attention to a certain position and do that quite easily without it necessarily being interactive. It just has to be timed with the VR experience. I mean, the, the one thing I'll add to that, I think that's, that, that makes a ton of sense, is that just on the information side, we sort of alluded to this before, but 
sound is a, music in particular, but sound in general is a super efficient way to, co to communicate an emotion from one person to another. So you could watch the same thing and have scary music in the background or have exciting music in the background and you're, and you're com communicating something different actually, often more efficiently than, than visually. But uh, so the practical use cases for some of those things are like we have a game called Dots. It's a, it's a connect the dots game, it's like an iPhone game. And one of the things we did very early on, they put sound, they, they designed music for that game and it told people how to feel. We, we wanted to make the opposite of Candy Crush. That shouldn't be something that commands your attention and is like, wait, I just came to and I spent 45 minutes doing this thing. This should be something that, that feels almost like a, they, like they have those adult coloring books that you can kind of, it should feel sort of meditative. And so we put music in there to communicate that feeling. It tells you kind of how you're supposed to feel. And I think just the second example given that, in that, in that uh, is that when you have a product that's pure audio, using sounds to just indicate things like you've reached the end of a feed, when you don't have a screen, is another way to sort of use sound to communicate how someone's supposed to think about the product. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I think that, you know, I, I've learned so many lessons on the technical side, but that's, I'm not gonna talk about that, but what I have learned is exactly that, that music and sound carries with itself such a big um, comp emotional component. There is such a big potential for making our experiences um, not just more immersive, but where we feel more, where we have the sense of uh, uh, greater collaboration between people. Uh, I'm looking also at it, at it from a perspective of, of an educator, which is what I do every day, uh, and in, in the field of education, creating an environment w which would potentially enhance education in the multimodal learning situation, I think that is something that I'm just extremely excited about moving, uh, moving forward.